help us advance our week-long discussions on infrastructure, building and maintaining the physical, social, and civic underpinnings of society, we're honored this morning to welcome celebrated author Amor Tolls for a joint presentation of the Chautauqua Lecture Series and the Chautauqua Literary and Scientific Circle, or CLSC. Having worked as an investment professional for more than 20 years, Mr. Tolls published his first novel, Rules of Civility, in 2011, his second novel, A Gentleman in Moscow, which was a CLSC selection in 2018. Saw Mr. Tolls take, uh, we, and we saw Mr. Tolls take the podium at the Hall of Philosophy that year. It was named one of the best books of 2016 by the Chicago Tribune, the Washington Post, the Philadelphia Inquirer, the San Francisco Chronicle, and NPR. His latest, 2021's The Lincoln Highway, debuted at number one on the New York Times bestseller list. It was also one of the New York Times 100 notable books of 2021 and one of this year's CLSC selections. It is our honor to host Mr. Tolls this morning on his return visit to Chautauqua, made possible by the George and Julie Follinsby Family Fund. A quick note about the format for this morning's program. You will hear some remarks from Mr. Tolls from the top, and then I will engage him in conversation until we transition to our traditional moderated audience Q&A. Please join me in offering a warm Chautauqua welcome to Amor Tolls. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Thanks for having me back. I want to start with a little bit of uh, housekeeping first. Uh, we are, I'm going to give you uh, some, some sort of uh, prepared thoughts. Uh, we're going to sit down and have a, a quick conversation. Then we're going to take uh, questions from the floor. If we don't get a chance to uh, uh, get your question answered, you can always reach out to me at amortolls.com. And if you go to the contact page, your questions and comments come right to me. Now, this is an amazing thing about the modern era that this is possible. It has its drawbacks. <laughs> now, to what I mean by that is that at this stage, usually when a new book of mine comes out, it takes about seven days for the corrections to start rolling in. <laughs> now, some of these are helpful, and some of them are not so helpful. So to give you sort of a feel for that, I wanted to share a couple with you quickly. So here's one uh, that came in. These are for the Lincoln Highway. Dear Mr. Tolls, you start too many sentences with ing words. <laughs> this is not helpful. But the best part of this email is, is how it concludes. Looking <laughs> looking forward to your next book. <laughs> so here's one. So in the Lincoln Highway, relatively late in the story, the hero Emmett and his friends are gathered in a fancy home in New York having sort of a celebratory dinner and things go awry. And so uh, at the end of the night, Emmett finds himself alone in the kitchen, uh, cleaning up sort of as an act of penance. And uh, here is uh, the email I received from Karen of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Karen writes, on page 477, you describe how Emmett was doing the dishes, saying that Emmett first washed the plates then the crystal, then the pots. <laughs> As the winner of the 1973 Betty Crocker Future Homemaker Award, <laughs> yes. at my high school, I can tell you with some authority that the proper way to wash dishes is first the crystal, 
then the plates, and finally the pots. Yes. Thank you, Karen from Wisconsin. So here's one I like. This is, uh, this is from Jane of Pequot Lake, Minnesota. And uh, to set this up, earlier in the novel, uh, the character Duchess and Wooly have borrowed Emmett's car. They're driving east on the Lincoln Highway towards New York City. And going through uh, Ames, Iowa, they run out of gas in the morning. And so Duchess gets out of the car, and he's looking up and down the road, trying to decide what to do. In the near distance, he sees that there's a liquor store, and he figures that since it's morning, it wouldn't be open yet. He could break in, maybe find some money in the till. If they couldn't find any money, he figures he could steal a couple of bottles of whiskey and give them to the gas station attendant in exchange for gas. So here is what uh, Jane of Pequot Lake, Minnesota has to say. There were no liquor stores in Ames, Iowa in 1954. <laughs> Hard liquor and wine could only be purchased at the county seat. This meant that my parents, who were heavy drinkers, <laughs> had to drive all the way to Boone. Every week, my mother and I would make the trip to Boone to buy a case of Gallo wine, some Gallo vermouth, and a no-name bourbon. When you paid, the clerk would produce a large ledger where you had to write down your purchase and sign it. Now, my favorite part of this email is the PS. PS, I lived across the street from Miss Evans, my fourth grade teacher. She told my mom that Mr. Harlan, our principal, would review the liquor store log every week to see how much and what his teachers were drinking. <laughs> All right, so now the book has been out for about a year and a half, so we're wrapping up the corrections phase, everybody. <laughs> but if you'd like to send me notes on your parents' drinking habits, you are welcome to do so. All right. Now, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, for me, uh, the starting place of a novel is usually a, a very simple premise or notion that presents itself to me at some point in time. Uh, like, a guy gets trapped in a hotel for a long period of time. So, yeah, that's interesting. Now, when I have an idea like that, it usually comes with some attachments. So in that case, as soon as I had this idea of a guy trapped in a hotel, I thought to myself, he could be in Russia. He could be an aristocrat sentenced to house arrest in one of the fancy hotels across the street from the Kremlin. And the story could span from the revolution to the Cold War. This is what I thought in the first few minutes. Now, when I have a thought like that, and it really intrigues me, I'll spend a couple of years imagining that story in every detail. So all the events, the places, the people and their backgrounds, and only when I fully under, have like imagined the story uh, from beginning to end in detail, what I even consider writing chapter one. Now, in the case of the Lincoln Highway, it was the same thing had a very quick premise, which I think those of you who've read it could guess, which is that I had this image of a young man, an honorable young man, having done some time in a juvenile prison, being driven home, and uh, ready to start his life anew, only to discover that when the warden drives away, that two of his friends from the prison have hidden in the trunk of the warden's car, and they have a very different sort of idea of what the hero should do next. So, this is sort of the idea that I began with. And as in the case of A Gentleman in Moscow, that came with some attachments very quickly. You know, for instance, I immediately thought, oh, this, this could be in the 1950s. Uh, the whole story could be like a 10-day tale. And uh, he's, the hero's returning to the family farm. His father has died while he's in prison. His mother is long gone. The farm is in bankruptcy. And his intention will be to grab his younger brother and head west to California but the friends in the trunk of the car instead will take him east to New York City. So as I say, all this is uh, sort of under, I, I, I knew within the first few minutes of having had the idea. Um, and then the rest of it gets built out over time. Now, having said that, when I sort of had this notion, what I did not know is when they left the farm 
and, uh, instead of taking a left and going to California, they take a right and head towards New York. What I did not know is what road they would travel on. And in fact, if you look at all my notebooks from the years of design, I would refer to it as Route X, because that that's all I really needed to know at that stage. Now eventually, once I started writing the novel, I really had to start to pin that down, because in fact, the road that I chose might affect how the rest of the story went. It may affect, you know, if they're going to go through Chicago, I would need to need that, need to know that. Are they going to stop in Chicago? You know, I had to sort of pin that down. So I took out a map of the Midwest, and I was looking at the, the roads in uh, Nebraska, and I find the perfect road going from kind of where I imagine the story, begin, story beginning, heading east directly towards New York City. It's Route 30, and but on the map, in small print, under Route 30, it said, uh, formerly known as the Lincoln Highway. And I thought, what is that? So I went and did some quick investigation, and everything I found out about the Lincoln Highway and its history amazed me. And it reinforced this notion that, <clears throat> in many ways, it was the perfect metaphor for, what the, for many of the themes that were at the heart of the book that I was in the midst of writing. So I changed the name of the title to Lincoln Highway immediately and uh, began to sort of think about the story a little bit differently. Now, you know, what was it about what I learned about the Lincoln Highway's history that made me so convinced that it was a good metaphor? Well, to understand that, uh, we, we have to go back and start with this guy. There he is, Carl Fisher. Now, Carl Fisher was born in the Indianapolis area in 1874. And his life is a classic American success story. Uh, he was born into a very poor family. His father abandoned the family when he was a child. So at the age of 13, as the oldest, he dropped out of school and went to work to earn money to keep his family uh, alive. Um, first job is he is, and from that moment forward, I should say, everything about Carl, Fisher, Carl, Carl Fisher's life is about motion. His first job is in the Indianapolis Railroad Station. When a train would come in, he would run on the train, and he'd sell cigarettes, magazines, newspapers, candy as quickly as he could, and then jump off the train as it was pulling back out of the station. This is job number one. In his teen years, the bike is sort of coming of age in the United States. He loves the bicycle. He races bicycles, early bicycles. And so, uh, as a teenager, he opens one of the first bicycle repair shops in Indianapolis. Now, a few years later, the car starts coming of age in America, and he thinks that's even better. So he is racing cars as a young man. Uh, he breaks a land speed record in, a, in an early automobile. Now, to give you a feel for just how early in the car culture uh, Carl was, this is the car that he broke the land speed record in. There you go. <clears throat> so, Carl naturally opens up an automotive repair garage, one of the first ones in Indianapolis, right next to his bike repair shop. And as someone who's running an early automotive repair uh, shop, he has a, an immediate understanding of what's going wrong in the early automobiles. And so he realizes that many of the accidents that occur are occurring because uh, the cars are not really set up uh, for travel at night, particularly if the weather's bad. So uh, at the age of, of 30, he licenses the technology from a company that makes the lighting for lighthouses and buoys. He applies it to the automobile. And within a matter of years, virtually every car in the United States has his Presto light lamp as the headlamp in the car. Uh, in uh, 19... Uh, 11, Union Carbide buys him out. So he finds himself suddenly, at the age of 37, married, with no children, in retirement, and worth about $150 million in today's terms. Now, he does not take to retirement well, because he's a restless person. His life is always about motion. So the first thing he does as a retiree is he goes back to his early love of car racing. And at the time, you got a picture in 1910, 11, car racing is very primitive. It's two guys basically meeting on a dirt road that's flat and, and driving as fast as they can. That was really the entire sport. 
So Carl figures, you know, if, if we built a paved oval, uh, you know, it was banked a little bit, I bet that we could have more serious racers come from a wider circumference to come and test their abilities on the track. So with that notion, he goes out and he builds the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Now, it turns out he's exactly right. Uh, race aficionados from across the country start showing up in Indianapolis to test themselves on the track and to compete with each other on the track. So Carl's looking at that and he says, you know, I bet if we raised a good purse and had like an official race and built some stands, I bet the people would come to watch. So he launches a little thing known as the Indy 500 and the first year, 80,000 people come to watch the race. Now, uh, at this point in time, Carl is spending in, with his wife his winters in Florida. That's where they vacation in the winter. He has a house there in Miami. At the time, Miami is on the shore of the Biscayne Bay. And uh, you have sort of the Miami, the, the town, the hotels and the residences, etc. You have the Biscayne Bay, and then beyond that is a narrow barrier island that is empty. That's Miami in 1912. Um, now, because Carl is restless, one of the first things he does in Miami is he buys a powerboat and he spends his days zipping back and forth along the Biscayne Bay. And one day he really focuses on the fact that there is a bridge which starts in Miami, goes halfway over the bay and stops midway. He becomes curious. He figures it must be headed, it must have been headed towards the barrier island. So he goes out anchors, gets off, he's wandering around the barrier island, and what he discovers is that it is owned by an old farmer. And the old farmer was had growing avocados on the barrier island, and he had built the bridge, the first half, with the notion that he'd grow the avocados on the island, and then he'd drive them into Miami and sell them at the restaurants and the hotels and the supermarkets, etc. Um, but he runs out of money halfway through the construction of the bridge. Now, as the old man and Carl are walking around the farm, Carl is thinking to himself, you know, this is a nice place for a vacation home. I mean, forget Miami, because here, out on the barrier island, you've got the, the ocean breezes, it's about 10 degrees cooler, you've got the views of the Atlantic, and you can look back and see the lights of the city. And he thinks, you know, this is terrific. So, he tells the old man, I will finish your bridge for you in exchange for some of your land. The old man takes the deal and he gives Carl a mile wide of the island running from shore to shore. Carl takes this piece of land, takes a little corner of it, and the first thing he builds is this. Which is the Flamingo Hotel. And in so doing, he launches what we now know as Miami Beach. Because everybody immediately recognizes that Carl is right, that this is the place to have a hotel, a restaurant, a wealthy home. Uh, there's a scramble to buy and build. Carl owns this giant chunk of the land and he makes a second fortune. <coughs> um, excuse me. Now, now, as Carl and his wife are going back and forth from Indianapolis to uh, Florida, Carl becomes very concerned about the state of American roads. Uh, at the time, there was about two million miles of roads in the United States and less than 10% of them were paved. So now this meant that any time there was serious rain, you were stuck you know, because of mud. Um, but the bigger issues were things like the fact that roads evolve uh, to spiderweb out from communities. You know, the roads were kind of developed to take farmers and residents or you know, light manufacturing facilities to get them into town where you have the postal office, the, rent, the train depot, the banks, the whatever else. You know, that's what most roads were, a short route from a city center or community center out into the, the local uh, environs. Roads were not really designed to go long distance. There weren't, it wasn't a road built to go, say, from uh, Boston to Denver, because that's what trains were for. So as a result, if you did try to drive across the country, what you found was uh, the roads were often hard to connect, you know, as you're making the journey, but there was also no gas stations, there's no hotels, there's no restaurants. So if you wanted to go across the country by car, you had to carry with you tents, water, gas, repair parts, food. And the early pictures of those who crossed the country, what they really look like is polar expeditions. You know, it's not a vacation. So at that time, 
only about 150 people a year would cross the country by car. And Carl thinks this is unacceptable. At the time, the federal government had no interest in the road systems in the United States. They, didn't, they viewed it as a local uh, matter. And so Carl decides uh, that there should be a road that crosses the country. It's principally a patriotic vision. He thinks that Americans should have the ability to go across and, and sort of see the country from sea to shining sea. That's his notion. And so he decides to do it himself. And uh, he starts a barnstorming tour. He goes up and down the East Coast and throughout the Midwest raising money, giving speeches. Uh, he convinces Teddy Roosevelt to chip in. Thomas Alva Edison chips in. He convinces the heads of Packard Motor Car and uh, Goodyear Tire to chip in. He convinces citizens to chip in in growing numbers. The Boy Scouts start raising money. And after a period of years, he successfully raises the millions of dollars necessary to build this road, uh, which he names the Lincoln Highway. And here it is. Starts in New York City at 42nd Street and Broadway and goes almost straight across the country through 12 of the contiguous states, ending in a park in San Francisco, Lincoln Park, overlooking uh, the Pacific Ocean. Now, and he builds this, and uh, to give a sense of how it changed uh, the way that people sort of navigated America, having said that 150 people would cross the country by car uh, before the building of the road, Within the decade, more than 20,000 Americans per year would drive across the country by car. So it was a major change in the way that people saw mobility within their own nation. Without question, it was the most famous uh, road in America uh, in the 1920s, in the 1930s, in the 1940s. Um, and then it kind of began to sort of disappear from the American imagination. And the reason why is, is interesting, it's, it's sort of a classic case of an invention sowing the seeds of its own demise. What happens here is that uh, after Carl builds the highway, we have the First World War. At the end of the First World War, the leaders of the American military become concerned that Americans will lose interest in supporting an active and viable military. An enormous military power had been built to fight the war, not only the gathering and training of men, the building of, of forts, uh, but also the building of equipment, the invention of all new kinds of weaponry, you know, whether that's in the air or on the ground. And the American military leadership realized that with the war ended, Americans could quickly say, OK, we don't need that anymore. And the whole thing could sort of fade over a period of time, and that that would put the country at risk. Um, now, of course, they also had a self-serving thing here, too. They were trying to support their own profession. So they come up with this idea, which is basically a publicity stunt. They're going to take a convoy, and they're going to start at the White House, and they're going to drive across the country all the way to the West Coast, showcasing American military might as a way of getting the American citizens behind the idea of, of a standing military, an ongoing military investment in the country. Um, the convoy, give you a sense of its scale, uh, Here's what it includes. The convoy was made up of about 80 vehicles, including heavy-duty trucks, fuel tankers, artillery tractors, an aerial searchlight truck, armed reconnaissance cars, ambulances and motorcycles, collectively manned by 35 officers and 260 enlisted men. So they set out in 1919 from the White House. They head straight north. They take a left on the Lincoln Highway because that's the only way to cross the country. And they start driving the Lincoln Highway all the way west to California in this giant convoy. And the whole thing is a fiasco. <laughs> and it's a fiasco because it was supposed to be this great publicity stunt. And they had organized you know, bands to welcome them in towns across the country and mayors to present things and people to gather. Well. The Lincoln Highway was the first highway to cross America, but it wasn't really designed to support a convoy of this scale. And in addition, you still didn't have gas stations, hotels, restaurants. So they keep getting bogged down. They're missing their parades. you know. So they're showing up five days late. Uh, it's very embarrassing. And it turns out that one of the uh, 35 officers, really one of the 35 officers who's really in charge of this fiasco is a young lieutenant colonel who you know, recently uh, did his time in the, for, in the, during the First World War 
and his name is Dwight David Eisenhower. And Eisenhower on this entire trip on the convoy is like, this is a disaster. And he had seen the roads in Germany, the very impressive highway systems in Germany. And so he thought, you know, we have got to change this. So one of the first things he does when he becomes president in the 1950s is he announces, we are going to have an American highway system. And here's what he builds. Here it is. Now, the, reading, the writing is quite small, but what it says up there at the top is the national system of interstate and defense highways, because that's the way Eisenhower sold it to America. So he said, you know, we're going to do this enormous investment across the country. It's going to have commercial benefit. It's going to have cultural benefit. But it is essential because of military benefit. Because if we're to be attacked in the future, we don't know whether it'll be from the West Coast, the East Coast, from Mexico or Canada. You could have multiple invasions at the same time. How do you move troops to the point of invasion? How do you get them there quickly, you know, before you get overrun? And if, the, if there's a second attack, how do you get, you know, redeploy forces? And the way you do it is through this, this incredible network that from anywhere in the country, you can get anywhere else in the country at the fastest possible pace through very well-graded, paved, wide highways in this uh, spiderweb fashion. Uh, so this is what Eisenhower creates. Of course, it bypasses uh, some of the smaller towns. It bypasses some of the old roads. And overnight, the Lincoln Highway becomes obsolete. And, and it, it's, this is what it looks like now. There you go. And that's you know, a picture that I took myself driving on a, you know, uh, maybe two summers ago. Um, now, Having said all this, uh, most of what I've just told you is not in my book. Right? It's not in the book. Because the Lincoln Highway is not a work of history. It's not a Wikipedia entry. You know? It is a novel. And so very appropriately, at its center are individuals. In particular, in this work, it's a group of 18-year-olds who are at that moment in our lives when they suddenly discover that they have the liberty and the responsibility to begin making a variety of decisions for themselves, such as, what is the difference between right and wrong? What does it mean to be an American? How should I treat others? What should I expect of myself? And ultimately, who is it that I want to become? And this is really what the book is about. So with that, I'm going to join uh, the conversation here, and we look forward to hearing your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, that was fascinating. You must have done a little research. Well, a little bit, not much. Thank you for being with us. Welcome to our living room. Thank you for having me. So, uh, so I wanted to uh, organize our conversation for the audience and, and make sure we leave time for your questions. But I thought we'd start with just first talking a little bit about um, the Lincoln Highway and its specific relationship to this week's theme, which you've done beautifully. Um, and then because we're an audience of both readers and writers, uh, talk a little bit more about your craft, give us a little window in um, on, on the making of the Lincoln Highway and anything else that you'd like to talk about in relationship to your process. And then um, leaving some time for some stories, including the obligatory questions about where you get your inspirations. And then we'll go for audience questions after that, okay? So um, one of the aspirations of this week uh, where we focus on infrastructure is to rekindle our fascination with the built world around us. Were you surprised by the response and the rekindling of the fascination with the Lincoln Highway um, in terms of the audience response to your book? Uh, was I surprised by the response? Um, I don't know. Uh, it's nice to have people enjoy your work. And you don't, you, you don't write it anticipating what its reception is going to be, because uh, I think that would be... Or, or you do so at your peril, I should say. You know, what you try to do is focus on the work itself and, and develop it and do the best you can and hope that it lands in a way that interests people. You know, and, and I, I got to say, like, if I really spent a lot of time thinking about how my books would be received from a popular standpoint, mm -hmm. I certainly wouldn't have written a book about a guy in Russia who never leaves a hotel for 30 years. <laughs> that, that makes no sense, you know. 
But that's what I kind of loved about that project is that it made no sense as a pitch. You know, it's a terrible elevator pitch. And because uh, that means like, that I don't have to worry about that. And instead, I can sort of try to do the story justice. And then you cross your fingers and hope that it, it, it connects with people. Yeah. I don't know about those in the audience who read it, but the, the very first thing I did after finishing it was go to a map okay. and, and really understand the, the pathway of the Lincoln Highway and then do some of the research that you just told us about. Well, you know, so maybe just to pause for a second and sort of talk about, you know, the, the road as, as a narrative device, I guess if you want to say that. I mean, if you look at the history of Western narrative, um, and I, I really think of, I don't think of Lincoln Highway as a road book, I really think of it as a journey novel, if you want to classify it. And if you think of Western culture, you know, the history of Western narrative, the journey narrative is one of our earliest and most important narratives. So if we go all the way back to the Greeks, who were sort of the beginning of serious narrative in the West, <coughs> excuse me, uh, you have Homer's uh, The Odyssey is of course one of the first great works to come out of that culture, which is a journey narrative uh, with Ulysses having just won the Trojan War, trying to get home. Uh, that's all he wants to do is go home to see his wife and family and to return to his kingdom and it takes 10 years for him to get there. This is the Odyssey. If we move on to uh, the Roman era, sort of the next great culture uh, in the West, uh, the most important narrative to come out of that culture is uh, Virgil's Aeneid, which again is a journey story. And only in this case, Aeneas was also at the Trojan War, he just lost it. And so at the end of the Trojan War, his city has been burned to the ground, his culture has been decimated, most of his family has been killed, and he sets out not to go home, but to establish a new uh, society. And uh, on that journey, that is the, the Aeneid. If we keep moving forward, uh, the beginning of uh, English, uh, serious English writing, uh, we have Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, you know, with the pilgrims on their walk uh, towards uh, Canterbury, trading stories as they've gone. In the Spanish tradition, uh, we, we have uh, Don Quixote, uh, Cervantes' is Don Quixote, which is, many would argue is the first, it's the prototype for the novel, for the future, it's what becomes the novel as an art form. And again, you know, you have uh, Don Quixote traveling the countryside. When you get to the United States, you know, we start serious narrative in America really close to the peak uh, with Herman Melville's Moby Dick, where he takes this new uh, American uh, language and applies it to a narrative which is once again a journey. Ishmael gets on the Pequot uh, at the beginning of the book and he does not get off the boat until the last page, basically. And so why is this? Why is it that uh, the journey story keeps coming up again and again and again throughout the history of Western culture? And I, I think that the answer is, is not complicated. I think it's what any of us would anticipate, which is that if you look at the, what drives storytelling, it tends to be about the evolution of an individual or a group of individuals. We take a person or a small group of people and they face an obstacle or obstacles. They need to overcome those obstacles. But in so doing, they have to make choices, take actions. And those actions have repercussions for themselves and for others, which have moral implications. And from all of this, the individual or individuals change. They change as people, and they, they, their vision of the world changes as well. This is what most narrative is describing in one way or another. And so it was very natural in storytelling to take a physical journey as the basis, if what you're gonna do is explore how the individual faces obstacles and makes choices and, and the moral implications of that, why not tie it to a journey, a physical journey, which becomes an instant metaphor for what's unfolding. And if you look at the history of the novel, what's kind of funny is that, is that the same idea keeps being used, but the journey becomes smaller and more intimate, because by the time we get to Edith Wharton, or, you know, or Henry James, it's still the same mission, it's just that the, 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 all the discovery and danger is on the journey from like the bedroom to the tea parlor, you know? <laughs> That's the journey, you know? Something happens on the staircase and everything changes as a result. Um, but anyway, so, so it, I think it's very natural as a storyteller to sort of be interested in kind of the role that these, these roads play, um, but they really are just a landscape to explore the changes that we undergo as individuals. Fascinating. Thank you. Thank you.
Well, let's talk about your journey as an author. You've talked quite a bit um, about your process and um, the, the research piece of it. How has, how has that changed over time, or is, is your formula solid, and can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, I think, you know, any of us in a craft of any kind, of course you're changing and evolving based on your experience and, and, and what works and what doesn't work. Probably for me, the, I began writing as a kid, I should say. And uh, I knew I wanted to be a writer when I uh, exited first grade. And from that point forward, I was, I was sort of writing. I began writing at that stage. I was reading and writing and reading and writing. You'd read something. And so, you know, and at that stage, you, you, uh, the, first, uh, the first time I was really addicted to reading uh, was The Hardy Boys. You know, it was a, in the summer, I remember, like, reading a book a day and, you know, sending my father to the bookstore again and again and again. And, but so from that point forward, you'd sort of take, you'd read something and then you sort of go experiment it in your writing and, and then you'd go on to the next thing that you'd read and experiment with that and sort of you move back and forth between reading and writing and it's been that way ever since. Um, I uh, wrote fiction in high school, I wrote it in college, I wrote it at, uh, at graduate school at Stanford. As a part of my life, I moved to New York in my mid-20s and, uh, and I began to write a novel but I felt very uh, claustrophobic and, uh, and lonely and broke. <laughs> so, so I joined a friend of mine who had started an investment firm and 20 years later we were still working side by side. In the course of that, the first 10 years I stopped writing, and I think I shared this when I was here last, but I stopped writing for 10 years knowing that if I didn't get back to it, I would end up, you know, bitter and a drinker, you know, <laughs> if I didn't become a writer. So uh, I did end up writing a novel starting in my mid-30s. It took seven years. And at the end of the seven years, I didn't like the book. You know? and, and that, if you spend seven years doing something and you don't like, like the outcome, you should reflect on that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, so at any rate, it, uh, a lot of the biggest changes in the evolution of, of the way I approach my writing came out of that experience. That's really when I became an outliner you know, I realized that in, in what I'm trying to achieve in the novel really requires a lot of forethought. And uh, so I became a dedicated outliner. Um, I realized during that failed project that the, f the, the new chapters I was writing in year three, four, and five felt heavy from the beginning, you know, because <laughs> you've been carrying, you know, this water for so long. And so I sort of got in the habit of saying, okay, the first draft you should try to write in the first year or year and a half while you're really high energy and fresh. And then you can spend as many years as you want revising that, but you've captured, you're trying to capture the lightning in the bottle in that first year, you know, and, and make the most of that and uh, use the following years to make the, the story the best that it can be. So I say, like, you know, those practices kind of really came out of that initial failed project, and, and, I, and I'm pretty, I stick with that, in, you know, now because it seems to work for me. So were there people in your life that were disappointed in your choice to move away from writing early on or encouraged you to continue to keep, it, keep that fire burning? What, who, who mentored you in this process? Um, well, when I think that, you know, all, any of you who are artists, whatever the field, you, you've probably been through this yourselves, which is that if, if, you, if you know as a young person that you're, you're gonna, you want to pursue a particular art, writing, music, acting, dance, whatever, um, you, you have this dual life. And the dual life is a conviction that you can do this, right? I, you know, I remember being young and being like, I can, do, I can write fiction as certainly better than my peers, um, but if I, as I read, uh, you know, published books, I can write better than that guy, and, and, I, and I think I could write almost as good as some of my heroes. You know, I, th I'm, I, feel, I feel I have the capacity for that. So you have that kind of mindset. The other mindset is, I'm deluded, you know? <laughs> You're like, why would I think that I can do that? I, there's no evidence of that, you know? And so you kind of, you have this sort of two parts of you that go back and forth. And, uh, and you know, the fact that when you're a teenager, your mother likes your work, that doesn't matter. <laughs> Sorry, Mom. You know, I love Mom, but, you know, it doesn't matter. So, so you're, you're kind of going along, carrying this sort of dual dynamic of confidence and, and, delu and delusion. And uh, so for me, a major turning point was when I was at Yale, there was a visiting writer named Peter Matheson, 
who's a great novelist, a great writer of uh, natural writing as well. He also had founded the Parish Review. He's just a really an extraordinary person. And I was a fan. He came to Yale. I applied. I got into his seminar. <clears throat> and he, uh, at the end of maybe three weeks in, he, as class was breaking, he said, listen, could you stay for a minute? And so I stopped, and he said, um, and I had handed in a, a number of stories at that point. And he said, listen, I don't know, Amor, I don't know who you are. I don't know what you're from. I don't know I, where you're from. I don't know what you want. I don't know why you're here. Mm -hmm. But uh, based on what you've handed in, I think there's a clear possibility that you may be gifted at this. And so as a result, I'm going to take your time very seriously here, and I hope that you're going to take your time with me very seriously too. And you know, that was a major turning point for me. That's where, that's not mom. That's you know, a person you admire uh, in a variety of ways, uh, seeing something in you that you thought was there, but you really had no proof. And so, and that's a great thing. And as I say to you know, young artists, you don't need that to happen every year in your life. You need it to happen like once every 10 years, you know, because mm -hmm. you can carry that for a long time. So in answer to your question, when I went into the investment business, Peter was sorely disappointed. You know, he was very unhappy. And he would check in on me. We would have, and I was just sort of in that phase that I stopped writing for a while. And he kind of, he knew it. And because he would kind of check in on, we would have dinner once a year or lunch. And he would sort of say, hey, how's that project going? The one about blah, blah, blah. And, and I wouldn't, I'd say, oh, you know, not, you know, I haven't really made much progress. And so he was really disappointed. He felt very let down. He felt like he had wasted some time with me and that I was wasting time. And um, so finally, we were at this, during this phase, this 10-year period, we have dinner one night. And at the end of the dinner, he says, Amor, and maybe he was you know, in his 60s or early 70s at this point. He said, Amor, I got to tell you that in my life, you know, going back to when I was in my 20s, uh, that I've seen all kinds of artists go to Wall Street. And I can tell you that that from multiple generations of experience, that there's something about that job that either pays well enough or it's interesting enough or the people are charismatic enough or whatever, that when people go to Wall Street, they never come back. So I think that you should assume that your life as an artist is over. <laughs> and that was the end of dinner. <laughs> no dessert. So. <laughs> so, uh, but you know, that, that, it really, I, you know, I carried that with me, you know, and, and for I, but the, the notion that, um, that as I looked forward, that I might, you know, let Peter down, let myself down, it was the, the, the voice of Peter saying that was always there. And so that's what kind of in mid-career got me to go and write that failed book. And that's kind of what, when the book didn't work, that's what got me to say, all right, we go again. Take what we learned and we go again. And, uh, you know, and for that, I'm forever grateful. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I should say that, that, that when Rules of Civility, when I, that was the first book where I wrote kind of in this new process, or sort of rethinking of it, and, you know, that book was, you know, then sold at auction and, and became a bestseller. Peter was still alive at the time. And so we had lunch, you know, shortly after the book, hit the bestseller list, and that was a great relief, you know, to me. But, you know, yeah. Perfect. Thank you for sharing that. We are an intergenerational community of yeah. readers and yeah. writers, and I, yeah. I know your story will inspire some, some young writers and aspiring writers. Thank you. So I told you before this, uh, this presentation that um, I'm an evangelist. I tell everybody that I know to read your books. Thank you. And, and they like me for it, so that's why I do it. it there's something there for me. Um, and, and what I tell them about the Lincoln Highway is that it's a mashup of Curious George, The Outsiders, and The Wizard of Oz. Um, and at least, uh, at least two of those stories may be regarded as canon in American literature. And I just wondered, is there, do you dare think about your work as something that will have a lasting impact uh, across generations? Um, I, you know, I, I, sorry, I, I would, I would, I'm going to phrase it slightly differently, which is, is I, don't, I don't write saying, uh, oh, you know, I want my books to last forever, or I want my name to last into the future, or that kind of thing. But, but you know, I, I do write, I'm right aware, 
are, I'm very interested in looking at and saying, what, what are the books that have survived? If we look at what we read today that was written 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 150 years ago, you know, we read Tolstoy, we read Dickens. You know, what is it about those works that continue to interest us and entertain us, sustain us? And, and, I, and I do think about that a great deal. And, and my thought process about that does drive me a good deal. It shapes my artistic ambition. And, and what I, my feelings about that are that come down to the fact that I think that the novel uh, is, a, I think of it as a machine for meaning. So if we look at it as an art form, uh, it allows the writer to create a story which may be entertaining uh, and that may engage us as readers. But in addition, the novel at its best incorporates a slew of elements of craft. So within the novel, are, there's obviously plot, but uh, you know, there's character development, there are settings, there's dialogue, uh, there's the point of view, there's the structure of the work, and there's all those en enormous array of poetic elements, you know, individual metaphors that are used, similes that are used, allusions and allegories. There's the poetry of the language itself, how it sounds to the ear. You know, all of these are elements of craft. And a novel is, is, is built by t bringing together thousands of those elements of craft when you break it all apart, right? Because every individual word choice is a part of that process. And so you have this product, this thing, this book, this story, which ideally is engaging, ideally is entertaining, but at its best, it contains this incredible loose array of all these elements I've described, which are operating in some form of harmony, that we as the reader feel like, yeah, everything that should be in this book is in this book, and nothing feels out of step, and it kind of begins where it should begin and ends where it should end, but when we, when we step back, all of these various elements allow us as the individual reader to draw our own conclusions about what that story means. About, it affects our sentiments and our ideas in a way that may be different than how that book affects uh, somebody else. Now, I, and I say this is a critical factor in the finest of writing because it's one of the reasons why a novel over, can survive time. Because as it turns out, something that's composed in that way, people of different genders can read it. People of different ages, people from different social classes, people of different races and religions, people from different countries. And that's what we see in something like a Tolstoy or a Dickens, is that despite this enormous variety of experience, people can continue to return to it, and given its complexity, walk away with a personal experience that is very enlightened to them in a way which may be very different from the experience of someone else who's reading it with an entirely different background and an entirely different point of view. And uh, so, as I say, that's really what drives me, which is how can I create a work of art that ideally would have that outcome? That's the aspiration. You know, it's not a prediction. It's the goal is to write something that has the nuances, has the layers, has the complexity of parts that would allow different readers from different backgrounds to enjoy it, not only now but in the future, in a way that is meaningful. That's what I'm doing. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just going to ask one more question, yep. and then we're going to, to move on to the audience question and answer portion. But um, dare I say, you have an incredible and a distinctive gift for turn of phrase. The characters in your book are very quotable. And here's one of my favorites from A Gentleman in Moscow. For what matters in life is not whether we receive a round of applause. What matters is whether we have the courage to venture forth despite the uncertainty of acclaim. There's poetic gold like this in all of your books, and where does that inspiration come from? Uh, well, thank you, first of all. Um, I, what I would say is that, and this is true, is, is that in any of my works, when a reader, and I'll say I, I want to travel across the country, or when someone sends me an email and somebody says, you know, this passage meant a lot to me, uh, I thought it was very moving, I thought it was very insightful or philosophic, I, you know, I, I uh, sent it to my daughter, I, I read it out loud to my wife, whatever. You know, when they say that about a particular passage in my work, 99% of the time, that 
thing, which they've pinpointed, is something that I would never have thought of in the course of my daily life. You know. <laughs> it's not something I would say to my children or that would occur to me as I walk down the street or that I would say to a friend. It is almost always because of the process of writing a novel, you're creating individuals whom you are not. And so what you do is you create this person who has a different background than you, and you're putting them in a situation that, in which you've never been in, and s suddenly, as they navigate that circumstance, they look around, the character, and they'll say, you know, the thing about it is da-da-da-da-da-da. And usually when that happens in the course of writing, it comes as a little surprise to me. You know, the, like this passage that you're mentioning, I know exactly where that is. You know, the Count is talking to his daughter, Sophia, and, uh, and, and, he, and that piece of advice sort of comes sort of out of the writing of that moment. And usually when that happens, as I say, you're writing along and suddenly the character will say it based on their background, based on being in that moment in time, a um, uh, you know, place that I've never been. And usually when it comes, it comes really fast, bop, 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 and I usually hit the period and I'll think, well done, Count. <laughs> <laughs> you That's nailed it. that, you know. Wow, you know, and I'm, and that, you know, in the case of the Lincoln Highway, that, you know, uh, that, probably, that happened a lot with Sally. Like, I don't know what it was about her. Like, she was constantly surprising me with great thoughts. I was like, oh, yeah, you got it, Sally. You bet, you know. But so that is where that tends to come from. So I can't take much credit for it or whatever. <laughs> Half credit. Okay, okay, very good. Well, we're going to transition to the audience Q&A, and I know that as we do that, some members of the audience need to move on to other programs and obligations, so don't be surprised if people are getting up to leave. They will watch the Q&A you know, online. You know, I don't know if this, this, I don't know if this is appropriate. I, I'm going to quickly take a picture if that's okay. Of course. Cause, cause <laughs> because, you know, I don't know. The main reason is because my children wouldn't believe it. You know, that's really, that's really what this is about. So if you don't mind, wait, okay, here we go. Oh, is this, oh yeah, that works. Yeah, kids. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thanks, all right. All right, go ahead. Thank you. So just as a reminder, if you want to submit questions online, you can do it on Twitter using the hashtag questions.chq.org, or our ushers have pencil and paper, and you can just jot one down, and they'll bring them up to me. But I'll start with some questions um, that are in my little portal here. Uh, your characters cover such a breadth of types. Approximately what proportion is based on your knowledge and experience, and how much is from research? Uh, I, I'm not a research-driven writer, um, so I, and I actually kind of, uh, in all of my works, including *A Gentleman in Moscow*, I, I really push aside any sort of in desire to do applied research. I talked about that when I was here last time. I, I just I worry, for me as a writer, that if you do too much research before setting out on the process of imagining and writing a story, it kind of sort of you can feel it as a reader. It's just dropped in these sort of pieces of information and facts and objects and brand names and that weigh down the, you know, the narrative and sort of stifle it. So I really do try to write books that I feel comfortable inventing uh, based on what I know and what I've experienced and what I've read. And I'll, I'll write the first draft and only once the first draft is done will I go out and do some research around uh, the work. So in the case of A Gentleman in Moscow, I had never spent a night in the Metropole Hotel I wrote the book and then flew to Moscow and moved into the hotel. And I, I, when I wrote The Lincoln Highway, I'd never been to Nebraska, sorry Nebraska, and, uh, and I'd never been on the Lincoln Highway. And so I wrote the first draft and then I flew to Nebraska, rented a car, and started in a small town and began driving east. And that's the way I'll tend to do those things. I really do try to make uh, the imaginative component be uh, the driver in terms of uh, how the book is created. Uh, one of our um, audience members says that you have written a modern Huck Finn. How do you so vividly envision the moral values of characters that diverge so far from your own? Um, yeah, how, how, do you, how, do, the, how do you imagine the, the, the moral aspect of the characters? And First of all, that's very nice of the questioner to put it that way. 
Um, and this is sort of related to the thing we were talking about, I was talking about a few minutes ago, is that, is that the creation of a novel is really the creation of individuals. I mean, there's some experimental French novels that aren't like that, but, but mostly it's about creating individuals, three-dimensional individuals, serious narrative writing. That's the heart of it. And as a boy who began writing, you quickly realize that that's the thing that you're trying to perfect. Is, is how do you bring a voice to life through writing in such a way that the reader feels like it's a real person, you know, in a way that you think it's a real person. And sort of the, the development of that skill is, is sort of about, uh, I don't know, I don't even, it's hard to even describe. You know, you're, you're trying to master human psychology and bring it to, to, uh, to life through word choice. You know, really, that's what you do, and practice and practice and practice. But eventually, you get to the point where it becomes quite natural. You're imagining a third character. You've got the first two, and you're like, oh, you know what? That third character, I know, I know exactly who she is. You know, she's, she's, she's a little younger than them. She's feisty. She's, you know, I'm just making this up, right? But, you know, but, but uh, you know, and she's lost a parent. And, you know, she learns something hard while, you know, working for, you know, her, her on a job or whatever. And, and she's going to bring that. And you, you start to hear the person. And that's what really becomes the powerful moment, is when you can start to hear their voice, which is, which is not an accent, it's a perspective which is infused with her experiences, her prejudices, her sense of humor, her sentiments, her sense of what's right and wrong, all of that is built into how she would describe something, how she sees the world, what she would say in a conversation. And, and when you can hear that, that's when everything gets... Uh, that's the most powerful thing in writing for me. Is because when you really gather a sense of that tone of that person, that will define... Then you could write that person in almost any situation. And it would potentially be of interest to the reader. Because whatever the situation, you're getting access to the inner life of that character through the way they describe it. You know, and that's where you get this one-to-one -one correspondence between the reader and the character that can be quite uh, dynamic. And so that's always what I, I am looking for. And, uh, and it's kind of a mystery in a way how it works. Fantastic. As you were, as you were saying that, I was reading uh, a question about education. We're here talking about infrastructure this week and certainly education has been a topic, um, investment in the arts, investment in the literary arts. And it, it strikes us that you are that wonderful, ideal CLSC member that has both the, the art and the science down. You were a, a, a finance guy and you're an amazing writer. What was, what was part of your educational experience that enabled you to develop the wholeness? And, and what would you say to policymakers in terms of what our focus on the educational infrastructure should be in that oh regard? My God, I don't know that. <laughs> wow. You know, what can I say? Um, Obviously, I'm a humanities, I'm a product of a humanities education. I mean, that kind of comes across and thank you. Yeah, right. You know. And, uh, and, I, and I do, uh, you know, there's, there's been a lot written about this lately and, uh, and about the decline in the humanities in the United States. And there's a, a declining interest in being in, in, in studying the humanities. Uh, colleges are shrinking uh, the amount of courses that are available in the humanities. And, in a, and so maybe this is all cyclical. And, you know, there's been a great growing interest in, in STEM, which is an amazing, you know, course of study. You know, scientists, there's been an over, a, a, a too much interest in business, let's say, as a course of study, which really isn't a course of study, you know. But, but, <laughs> but you know, yeah. You know, but, uh, but I, do I do believe that the humanities are incredibly important uh, for young people uh, and, and that, and even as a, a, a person who comes from a business background, we hired humanities people all the time um, because they sort of brought into it this sort of awareness, not only of technical skills, but of a curiosity about the lives of others and a sort of a habit of making inc of inquiries about why do you do that? How does that work? Uh, and without prejudice. Oh, you do it that way because of that reason? No, oh, that's interesting. I wouldn't have done it that way myself. But no, why, you know? And so you kind of have this sort of combination, as I say, of, of, of the natural curiosity, the desire to connect with another human being as a way of learning, uh, a lack of prejudice in terms of trying to take in uh, what they're saying and weighing the merits of it, you know, and comparing it to your own experience. And, and there's an enormous study on all of this, but... Uh, Reading, uh, particularly novels, is very it, one of the most powerful things to developing empathy. 
which of course makes sense, it's so common sense, right? Because empathy is our ability to understand another person's feelings, their situation, uh, to feel it in a serious way, which might give us hesitation about drawing a quick conclusion or a prejudicial observation because we're actually beginning to see the world for a second from their angle. And this is what books do, this is what novels do. The study of history can do that too. Um, so, so yeah, I think that's a very important skill set for us to continue to foster. And, uh, you know, and what you hope is that, as I say, it's a cyclical dynamic, which is that the pendulum will swing back in that direction in the next generation um, you know, as kids refuse to go to business school, you know, because dad did, you know, or what a mom did, you know. <laughs> Fantastic, thank you. Um, there are many questions remaining. We have just a little bit of time. I'm going to ask you one more question, yeah. and then I'm going to give you the opportunity yeah. to offer some concluding remarks. And I promise the audience members what we will do, since he invited us to, is take the remaining questions and yeah. put them into your portal. Yeah. Okay? Um, but yeah. everybody's dying to know. Because <laughs> you don't have anything else to yeah. do. You no, do exactly. Do. That's good. It's, it's, yeah. um, What's next? What are you working What's on? What's next? Yeah, you, and next? you could probably give me a couple of rapid fire ones. Okay, I'll watch all right. the clock. Okay, um, I got. I have some rapid fire. What's What's next? Uh, I uh, in April, I will have a collection of short stories and a novella that will be published. Uh, so, in less than a year, called Table for Two, and that is uh, six stories that are all kind of set in New York, mostly in the in sort of in the year two thousand and that sort of phase. Uh, and then there's a very long novella which is uh, you know, more, all, about 150 pages, which follows the character Eve from Rules of Civility to Hollywood in 1938. Yeah, thank you. And I, and I did a shorter version of that when a Rules of Civility came out. I was still obsessed with Eve, and so I went and wrote a small, like a, you know, maybe more like a 40 or 50 page investigation of her arrival in Los Angeles. And then that kept bugging me because that felt incomplete. So that now is, is about 150 pages. And so, so that and the short stories will be together in April. I've started a new novel, uh, and that is a, begins in Cairo at the end of the Second World War. It ends in New York City in 1999. Uh, and that's about all I'll say about that. All right. Yeah. Okay, rapid fire. Lots of questions about the characters in the book. Is yeah. that okay? Yeah. Um, as the loving creator of Billy, how do you describe him? Billy. You know, I love Billy as a character, and you know, the, I had already thought in great detail about Emmett, who's this very practical, uh, honest, sort of hardworking Midwestern sort. And I, and I, and I, as soon as I have thought of his brother, and I think this quite happens quite naturally in fiction writing or imaginative work, is he was an opposing spirit. You know, someone who you don't, you didn't need a younger brother who followed all the rules and was totally you know, practical and whatever and, and honorable and all this. I mean, he's an honorable kid, but but I wanted the whimsy of childhood to be the opposing dynamic, the eight-year-old versus the 18-year-old. And, you know, the, the, to be the reminder to the 18-year-old of how you can look at the world and wonder and how, you know, you, the, the sort of the, the doggedness of the questions that you might ask and the faith that you would have in a story that you heard and all those things that an eight-year-old can bring and that we kind of wean our way out of as we move towards adulthood. So, so Billy came to me very fast, but almost in a way as an opposition to, uh, to, the, Emma, to the hero of Emma. Another character question. Um, what were your thoughts while writing the last chapter of Duchess? Well, you know, the, the, the Lincoln Highway, I knew the ending, and like all, pretty much all my work, I knew the ending on the first day. And I knew what happened to Woolley, I knew what happened to Duchess, I knew what happened to Emmett. And uh, there was, some, there, I got a lot of early emails about the last 20 pages. I'm not going to tell you what happens in them here, but, but a lot of people were saying, I, I, I want to understand this, or what about that, or why does this happen? And, and it was, I was kind of way surprised by. But so if you go to amortolls.com in the Q&A, the, at the bottom are answers to frequently asked questions. And the very last thing that I answer is, what's, what's with the ending? You know, because because people wanted to know that. You know, so that's sort of anyway. So, but uh, but I feel like that the the book ended perfectly for the three characters. In in whether that was a happy or a less happy conclusion, it was exactly the way it should have been. And and you did all of that without giving anything away. That's brilliant. That's right. That's brilliant. Okay, can you talk about um, the through line of all all three of of the major books that that you've mentioned? Oh, Rules of civility. Yeah. Well, this is a little different than that, but I think this would be of interest. 
And we're, I'm keep looking at my watch because we've been warned. 12 o'clock and one second is a hard stop, you know. So you know, we're going we're to be honored that. But so <laughs> uh, the, this is a slightly different thing, I think, of what you're asking. But nonetheless, I think it's interesting. You know, I, there's an aspect of all my books which are interlinked. I like doing that, you know. So uh, in Rules of Civility, one of the central characters is Dickie Vanderweil. And at the end of that book, which is set in 1938, Eve says, you know, Dickie went on to kind of uh, prove himself. Uh, he went to Harvard Business School when the Pearl Harbor was bombed. He joined the Navy. He became an officer. And he ended up in the State Department. And uh, in A Gentleman in Moscow, which then in the 1950s, uh, he reappears as Richard Vanderweil, as, a, as an officer in the aftermath of the Second World War, and then a member of the State Department, uh, and becomes a friend of the Count in the Metropole Hotel as an American who's stationed at the embassy in, in uh, Russia. Uh, in Rules of Civility, um, the character Wallace Woolkit uh, has a home in the Adirondacks where his family gathers every summer, and uh, he gives the loans that house to Katie and Tinker for a retreat. Um, and that house plays a major uh, role in the Lincoln Highway because, as many people know, Wallace's nephew is in the Lincoln Highway. It's a central character. There's a watch that is given to Wallace by his father, which he then hands down to a character in the Lincoln Highway, who then hands it down again. And so, and I like these sort of uh, interconnections. I, growing up reading Faulkner, I just love the way his novels sort of operating in his imaginary Yachtan Patalfa County would have some kind of tie to each other. Because you could be reading one, and, and you could live in that book, but occasionally like a door would open onto another narrative. And it was sort of the light from that would sort of shine into the book you were reading. And the book isn't limit. You don't, you don't have to go read that book in order to appreciate this one. But if you've read them both, they can create sort of these sort of interesting connections. So my favorite is that. This is a little weird. But uh, when I was writing The Lincoln Highway, uh, I, was, I had written the whole thing. It was set in June. And because I wanted it to end close to July 4th. It's set in 1954 because I wanted it to be in the 1950s. And as I'm getting towards the end of it, I all of a sudden realized, oh my God, you know, John in Moscow, this 30-year story in Russia, it actually ends in June of 1954. And in fact, I start looking at it and I realize that the 10-day story of Lincoln Highway and the 30-year story of, of uh, John in Moscow, not only do they both end in June of 1954, they both end on the 21st of June, 1954. And uh, so, you know, I was like, oh, well, that's great. And now the culminating event of A Gentleman in Moscow is that at midnight on the 21st of June, 1954, uh, is when all the phones in the Metropole Hotel ring simultaneously, which occurs at midnight on the 21st of June, 1954. Well, so now, if you go to Lincoln, Lincoln Highway, the culminating moment in that book is when uh, uh, Billy and uh, Emmett are in the car driving out of the Adirondack camp. And that happens at 5 o'clock on the 21st of June, 1954. But given the time change... <laughs> yes. It happens at the exact same moment in historical time. And I don't know what that means, but I love it. <laughs> All right, so... Thank you. Thank you, thank you. All right, so wait a second. Let me find a word. So at the risk of getting into trouble, there's one more thing I want to share with you. So I'll be quick about this. But I did want to talk for a second about the way I envision history in my works. And the best way for me to do this, the role of history in my work, the best way for me to do this is by analogy. So what I want you to do is imagine that you, you, you come to see a play. You know, let's say it's Chekhov. It's the cherry orchard. You know, you're in your seats. This is the stage. Now, when you look across the stage, and you know, the, the set is a, a fancy, you know, estate in the countryside of, of Russia, 19th century Russia. Now, at the, in the nice, beautiful room, a living room in the estate. At the back of the living room are some French doors. And through the French doors in the distance, you can see the cherry orchard, which is in bloom. It's spring. You can see the, tree, you know, the, the blossoms in the distance through the French doors. Now, of course, when you're at a play and you're looking across the stage and you see that through the French doors, you're not seeing an actual orchard. What you're seeing is painted canvas, because that's what we'll do in a theatrical set, right? At the very back, you drop a canvas uh, on which is painted the orchard, so we can see that in the distance. Now, when the team paints that canvas, they're not going to do it in a hyper-realistic style. 
because that would actually look weird to the natural eye at the distance. Instead, they'll use an impressionist style. You know, they'll paint it in the manner of a Monet or a Cezanne. And so in that sort of impressionist style, we can almost see uh, the, the petals on the cherry uh, trees in motion in the light wind, and sort of in the dappled light. You know, that's the way, and it looks right to the natural eye. Now, in front of that, you've got the French doors. On either side of the French doors and the stage, you're going to have uh, bookcases built out of plywood and painted to look like mahogany. You know, and over here is a door that goes nowhere. And over here is a staircase that goes up to nothing, right? That's the nature of a set. But in front of those things is an actual dining room table surrounded by actual dining room chairs. And on the table is an actual China tea service. Now, this is very important that these things be real. Because, so picture what's happening here is, let's say it's a, a, a sister is sitting alone at the table having tea by herself. Brother enters. You tell that he's in sort of a heightened emotion. And we want to, when he kind of pulls up a chair roughly, pulls it up to sit at the table to talk to his sister, we want to, want to hear uh, the chair scraping across the floor, the wooden legs scraping across the wooden surface of the stage as he pulls himself up. And when he starts to speak to her, sharing his you know, feelings and high emotion, and he you know, slaps the table for uh, emphasis, we want to hear the physicality of that contact. And when she, having very patiently listened to her brother, you know, sets down her teacup, we want to hear that sort of delicate clink of the china cup landing in the china saucer, right? And this is all, as you say, this is very important so to bring for us as people in the theater to bring that scene to life. Now, my work is layered in the exact same fashion. So for me, history is the painted backdrop. It's hanging at the back of the stage. And when I execute it, I do not use a hyper-realistic style to capture that moment in history. I'm going to use an impressionist style because it's not a driver of the tale. It is there to give you a sense of place, a sense of time of day, a mood, but that's it. So history is back there in an impressionist format. Now, in my work, in front of that, there's a lot of plywood painted to look like mahogany. You know. <laughs> and these are parts of the stories where you might pause and you're like, wait, is that made up? Is that real? And the fact that you're not sure which it is, whether it's real or, or fake, that's terrific. I love that. But in front of that is the table and chairs. And just like in the play, it is very important to me that that feel very real to you. I want that to feel so real to you, it's as if you are sitting at the table with the brother and sister. And that you are sitting there listening and with a close enough proximity that you can read the changes in the expressions on their face as they talk. You can hear the shifting tones in their voices as they exchange their ideas and their sentiments. I want you to feel very real in that spot because that's where the action is. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks very much. CHQ Assembly is made possible through the collaboration and innovation of Chautauqua Institution's full-time and part-time staff, seasonal staff, and many volunteers, as well as participants like you, whose engagement, gifts, and subscriptions sustain our mission.